Got a full house this morning. One of each. And a kitty. Good morning. So I was uh, trying to find something to talk about this morning and I clicked through my email and I found an interesting article, which of course I'm only halfway through, so we're going to go through it together. <laughs> but quite interesting. So, uh, oh my gosh, yesterday was so incredibly busy at work that um, kind of never came up for air. I did have another veterinarian spend the day with me. She uh, works at a clinic that I used to work at many, many moons ago. <clears throat> which has now been sold to corporate. And she said, actually, as a corporation, they keep their hands off and they're pretty nice and let them practice their medicine the way they want to. So that's kind of nice to hear. Um, <clears throat> and she's trained in acupuncture but doesn't get to do it very often. So she wanted to come hang out with me for the day. And luckily, yesterday, I did acupuncture all day long. So talked about uh, food therapy, had a couple of consultations. And um, I am going to... Uh, post a blog and some pictures of a new uh, case that I saw yesterday. I don't think Lisa will mind. Um, Lisa has been struggling with her very large 140 pound dog with some skin issues for a few months. And when I read the records from the other veterinarian, I kind of thought I was going to see, you know, a couple little scaly patches on this dog. And when I walked in the room, I almost fell over. Um, and she said, well, you see my frustration. And when you see the pictures, you will see her frustration. She's been going to the veterinarian pretty much weekly and getting nowhere. And this poor dog is just a mess. And I don't think it's all food related. I, I, I don't think that's a big part of it. Uh, she's actually been feeding good food and, um, and home cooking, but this dog has, I think an autoimmune problem, but it's pretty serious. And, um, so we'll post some before pictures, and the dog is going up to Floss's grooming tomorrow for uh, a TheraClean micro bubble treatment, and I can't wait to see the after pictures because this dog is just full of crusts and scales, and I think he's going to feel lots better when all that comes off. So, and I haven't had my coffee yet, so I'm kind of miserable. Yeah, why? Because I need coffee. I, I'm I'm I've been really tired since the beginning of the year. I think I'm fighting a virus, and I just, man, there's not enough coffee in the world. I'm tired all day long. I've actually been sleeping, which is weird. Okay, so um, the article that I found this morning is on navigating pet food product claims, and so this guy apparently has been doing a series of blogs, and I'm gonna have to. This is um, part four, so I have to go back and find parts one, two, and three because it's pretty interesting. And it really, this is made for the pet food industry, but it's talking about the duplicitous nature of the pet food industry and how people make claims on their labels that aren't really real and they're misleading and we shouldn't really trust them. And he's actually writing this for the pet food industry, so I think it's kind of interesting. Um, but, you know, basically, these companies will try to get away with anything they can. And the interesting thing about FDA and state regulation, the only thing they care about is the label. Like, they have very specific um, rules about what font and what size font all of the different label parts can be in and how big they can be and some claims can't be in lettering that's bigger than other claims i mean you know i i would really be happier if they would spend a little more time regulating what's in the bag than what's on the bag because the font and the size and the placement of lettering really doesn't affect the nutrition that's going into my pets <laughs> but he was over there making faces at me but you know, 
they don't really they don't enforce the law about what goes in the bag what goes in the bag they clearly allow 4d animals and rendered meats and de decaying and diseased carcasses to go into those foods and they've you know they have said outright on tape you know no we're not going to enforce that even though it's against the written law so but they're very clear that they will regulate those letters on the bag and the pictures on the bag oh my gosh so you know you know when we went to them and said hey we all know darn well that this food in this bag does not contain filet mignon or grilled steak yet on the picture they have you know on the front of the bag they have pictures of grilled filet mignon and it says filet mignon flavored whatever that is because it's a chemical and that's perfectly legal to put on the front of the bag as long as they also have a picture of what the kibble looks like so as long as they have the bowl of kibble they can have the vegetables and the grilled steak falling into the kibble and floating through the air that's perfectly fine although very misleading don't believe it so um so this is really interesting he said that um uh you know pet food product claims are really supposed to be science-based claims but uh, most companies don't have the resources to develop new science-based claims through research and innovation you know they're just not going to do that oh good mom went outside and the dogs are going to bark um so companies utilize what he calls puffery claims which i think is very cool because i can just picture somebody puffing up their chest and be like well we're better which is exactly what they do so they um they say things like farm to table well a lot of food is farm to table that doesn't really say whether it's good where did it go in between the farm and the table i mean frankly animals that were rendered started out on a farm they end up on the table so a rendered animal could technically be farm to table so that's kind of a dumb claim and if that's you know something that somebody's using for advertising and that's a decision point for you for buying food that it says farm to table it doesn't mean anything and that meat could have and the vegetables could have gone to a lot of different places between the farm and the table um, and so they make also make misleading animal raising claims and um, that make us believe that the animal was humanely raised, but not necessarily. So when it says farm raised, okay, great. Maybe it wasn't confinement operation raised, but what's the definition of farm raised? So I've seen a lot of farms where the animals are packed in elbow to elbow, standing in muck up to their bellies, and they're fed, you know, GMO grains and, um, you know, kind of sketchy feed products that, you know, might be restaurant waste, could be Lord knows what. So just because it says farm raised, what's that mean? It doesn't mean it was humanely raised. They could have been beaten every day of their life, but they were on a farm. So that doesn't mean anything either. Um, and then he talks about the definition of natural. And natural does not mean that the ingredient or food excludes chemical treatments, GMOs, or that it's organic. Um, so then he talks about organic, and the definition from AFCO is a formula feed or a specific ingredient within a formula feed that has been produced and handled in compliance with the requirements of the USDA Nas National Organic Program. So the organic program is really specific, and I actually had a client um, that came in a few years ago, and they were trying to start an organic beef operation here in our county. And you have to buy an organic farm in order to raise organic plants and meat. And in order for it to be certified organic, the soil has to be organic, which means there can't have been any pesticides or herbicides used on that soil for a set number of years, and it's a long time. Um, and they have to follow USDA guidelines for land, soil, pest and weed management, origin of livestock, livestock feed, and health care. But just because it's organic, that does not mean that it is chemical or drug-free. 
um, and organic does not equal humanely raised. So we kind of like to think the same as farm raised. You know, organic beef, farm raised, doesn't necessarily mean that it was humanely raised. If you don't go out to that farm and see where those animals were raised and how they were handled, you have no idea. Um, so many companies and bloggers, he says, will tout that organic is healthier for people because no chemicals or drugs are utilized in the production of the crops or raising of the animals, but that's untrue. Um, synthetic substances um, are allowed for organic crop production, so they can use um, synthetics you know certain things for fertilizers that are supposed to be organic uh, but they can also use vaccines they can use um, ivermectin which is a parasite drug that's what's in heart guard um, those are allowed in the usda organic certification program so if you think that by buying organic meat that that cow was never or that pig was never exposed to any dewormers or vaccinations that's untrue they're allowed to be vaccinated. They're allowed to be dewormed. They're allowed to be given certain things. Um, uh, but the USDA does say that GMOs are not considered compatible with organic production. Um, uh, let's see. But by definition, GMO is an organism, a plant or animal whose genetic makeup has been altered in some way. To the purest, selective breeding for desired traits would be considered genetically modified. So that's very interesting. So, um, you know, when we're doing selective breeding to get a shorter nose or a longer tail, technically we're genetically modifying. How do you think that we got, you know, French bulldogs to have those really short faces and big ears and big heads and small butts? And, you know, if you look at, for instance, German shepherds of today in the show ring versus German shepherds that were working dogs 100 years ago, they don't look anything alike. Um, and there's a lot of breeds where that has happened. So technically that's um, genetically modified. Um and GM, non-GMO does not mean the plants or animals were raised without pesticides, hormones, or antibiotics utilized in traditional farming practices. So if it's non-GMO, that doesn't mean organic, and it doesn't mean that it didn't have hormones and pesticides used. Um, and in the U.S., natural does not equal non-GMO or organic. Uh, which is better claim, organic or non-GMO? He says it depends. Um, how much does your consumer want to pay and what's the popular belief of today? Well, and that's true because bloggers have, and people like me, we have a lot of influence on what you hear and see and read and what you will end up deciding is better. Um, so, at, oh, the next topic he's going to have is what does a product name tell you about the food? I'm going to have to find the rest of this guy's blogs because it's pretty interesting. But, you know, what it basically boils down to is that <clears throat> the pet food industry is really all about advertising. It's more about advertising than it is about food quality, frankly, for the most part. Because, you know, as we know, 95% of the pet food in the world is produced by the, well, it used to be the top three companies, but there's five that, and I saw the numbers the other day, Mars is leading the bandwagon by quite a bit. I think Purina is in second place for sales, then Hills, then um, Big Heart brand, which I believe is part of Smuckers, and then Blue Buffalo is in fifth. And Blue Buffalo has been moving way up those ranks. Um, and so really, I mean, if you look at the advertising that you see for pet food on TV, who do you see? Those are the companies you see. You see it on TV, radio, you see it pop up on Facebook, Amazon. They're advertising everywhere. And they're spending more money on advertising. If they spent those millions of advertising dollars on the food that went into the bag, they could offer us a much superior product for a much lower price. Um, and so this is the kind of stuff that goes into their advertising that is very misleading for the consumer. So you really need to do your research. You really, and this is why we make our own food for our guys, because when I'm making my own food, I have a much better idea of where that's coming from. Now that still means, you know, when I'm sourcing meat products, if I really want to know how that meat was handled, I've got to get all the way back to the source. I need to get all the way back to the farm where that meat came from. Um, and so we do the best we can 
But unless you're raising your own cattle or your own deer or your own pigs, there's no way to really know what the sourcing is on everything that you're feeding your pets. So the best you can, and yourselves. So the best you can do is the best you can do. And not all of us have the time or desire to make a million phone calls and go visit farms and see what's out there. Um, Susan Thixton, thankfully, does a lot of that research for us. And you can get her list on Truth About Pet Food. The interesting thing about that list is she sends... Um, questionnaires out to all the different pet food companies and the pet food companies need to be willing to take the time to answer those questions and be up front so if they've made Susan's list that means not only were the answers that they provided up to her standards but they also took the time to answer the questions and um, there are some companies that just don't want to be bothered and I think the fact that they don't want to be bothered um, is a black mark against them because if they have nothing to hide then they should take the time and Susan actually has a lot of clout as an influencer Susan's a pretty good influencer as an influencer I'm a pretty good influencer um, so kind of one of those things you don't want to make Susan mad the companies really shouldn't make me mad because I'm a big mouth <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go finish my cup of coffee we haven't fed the dogs we haven't had breakfast it was we had a long night um, at seven o'clock this morning, we heard this big truck in our driveway and it was Hugh's Christmas present, which was this huge toolbox being delivered. When the freight company said they wanted to deliver today, they did not say they wanted to deliver at 7 a.m. That would have been good information to have at 6.55. <laughs> Hugh was like, that truck's in our driveway. <laughs> he flew out of bed pretty fast. I have a lot of questions. Oh, goody. I never got back to Facebook. I actually, frankly, never read all my email yesterday. I was way too busy yesterday. I don't like this new schedule. I don't have time to get things done. Yeah, Hugh doesn't like it either. Hugh came to the office yesterday to hang pictures on our newly painted walls, and I didn't even see him at the office. I was so busy. <laughs> I think I saw him for about a minute and a half. A good girl. <laughs> You're gonna make him get up and attack. <laughs> Hey, good news. Four cases of books came in today, yesterday. So for those of you who ordered books, we'll ship them today. Say bye, kitty. <laughs>